First up is our panel with entertainment reporter for news.com.au, Bronte Coy and Gemma Tognini from GT Communications. Ladies, welcome. Hello. Hello. Who I let know. this happen? I'm not Did sure. Did you tell who the grown ups? Well, no, I haven't. We've kept this a secret. We really have. Bronte, uh, look, you and I both read Prince Harry's memoir spare for very obvious reasons. Um, and despite some of the quips and the snarls about it being sold at a discount, it's a number one bestseller. Love or loathe the Sussexes, there's still plenty of interest, isn't there? Absolutely. We're all still watching. We wanted to read the book, whether you love them or loathe them, as you said, because we were getting such a rare look into the palace dramas direct from a source. And that's what we're still getting from Harry and Meghan. And while there is clearly a deep Sussex fatigue that is setting in, even among people <laughs> that are big fans... Sussex there, it's, fatigue! It's happening. It. It's definitely happening. But in a lot of ways, kind of like a train wreck, you really still can't look away because there, there has been this kind of circus around them. But my, my concern for them, if I, if I have much of it, is, is really the fact that it's not a very long-term plan, that they burn so bright and so fast with their, with their you know, royal uh, it's secrets. Been a bit of and, it's been yeah, a bit of well, it's only been a few years. It's where does it go from here? What is that as a long-term strategy? So we're interested, but how long can they grip us for? Yeah. And with what? Exactly. With what? Gemma, uh, it's, uh, been Caroline. <laughs> it's been reported um, that they're considering selling the rights to spare. Well, right <laughs> now, but does a number one bestseller translate into a blockbuster? No, it doesn't. Not necessarily. And just to pick up what Bronte said about um, the fact that you know we have this voracious appetite and I hate myself for it I hate myself for knowing what's happening what they did with Lilibet's <laughs> birthday and the other kid Archie's birthday and I hate myself for knowing things about the Kardashians but that's what happens to us normally mm. sane people and you've got this bestseller but I would also argue that it doesn't even indicate that they're popular there's hate purchases in there I know people who are like I can't stand it but I have to read it and so translating into a, a bestseller necessarily is not, ne is not I, I don't necessarily think it's going to be, sorry, a blockbuster. Depends on who produces it. Depends mm. on what kind of scripting there is around Cast. it. Casting, production, marketing, all of that thing. I mean, for example, did you read the, Where the Crawdad Sings? Bestseller. A terrible movie. I actually did and I hated the movie, so See, there you go. I was about to movie. say. <laughs> I also didn't hate, I didn't love the book either. I thought it was really twee, but that's beside the point. Case in point. I don't think it's going to be necessarily a, a blockbuster, but I so agree with the Sussex fatigue, but then I'm like an addict. I can't stop. Do you know what's funny? I've actually got friends who bought the book. They're not Sussex fans. Bought the book and would have dinner parties and would have random readings at the, spare <laughs> at the dinner parties. Amazing. And I thought that that there was just what an amazing way to, you know, have a bit of broad discussion about that that autobiography. It's kind of like you have to draw a line because I watched the documentary so I could write for the paper on it. I yep. watched it so that you guys didn't have to out there in <laughs> viewer land. And, it, God's and work. it was, but to your point about do I have sympathy, you know, symp what sympathy do I have for them? I, a little bit for Harry because he's clearly a broken man child. And mm. at what point does he actually get to have some kind of closure and deal with his clearly... Issues. Legions, or issues, demons, yeah. all that sort of stuff. He's just an angry little turd throwing pot shots at everyone. <laughs> this is true. But it has been quite a while <laughs> since he's moved to the US. Yes. He wants to ditch this royal in exile moniker. Fair enough. Mm. But how do you do away with that narrative when it's your connection to the royal family which gives you your relevance? Well, this is exactly the problem. And I have actually thought about this very specifically over the last six months. Every time we sit here and we're thinking, what are they doing and what advice are they getting yeah. that this is still happening? And I thought, OK... If I had my way, if I was in charge of Brand Sussex, what would we have done? And I was trying to think, and I guess what the expectation was is that they'd come straight out the gates, and of course COVID hit right after, sure. so that's out, that is out of their control. But right out the gates, some high-profile speaking engagements, kind of follow the Obama model in that way, um, make, it, make, make their influence and power known in that way while drip-feeding information about their time in the royal family so that that intrigue stays there. I'm thinking that would keep us captivated, but also it's showing a skill set and it's creating a brand, whereas now, as you said their link is to the royals the royals aren't even speaking to them so where do we go from here they've got no new there's no new content and, it's run out and the the strategy that is a brilliant strategy you want to come work for us by the way <laughs> <laughs> just came not up with it kidding, not even kidding we'll take that offline but um the, the, they have to have like the speaking engagement stuff and the podcast stuff like being dumped it speaks to the fact that there's a lack of substance there right so i have as you probably both have been in the room with 
very, very highly billed speakers who are fundamentally disappointing because whether they, their lives, whether they've been in media, whether they've been in other places where their lives have been scripted mm. to within an inch of their lives and they can't actually communicate or they don't, they don't have mm. a personality, they don't have a character. I don't know that I would, I don't know that I would be that thrilled to hear what he has to say. But doesn't it all come back to authenticity? Sure, 100%. So, I don't think people are buying that Harry is the, like, the real house husband of Montecito, right? I just don't <laughs> think that they are. Um, and hence the moniker, because he's he's not in the UK, doesn't even have a residence in the UK. He's been ditched, he's kicked out of Frogmore Cottage. He has been kicked out of Frogmore Cottage. Um, how do, you, how do you shake that? Well, it's difficult when you're living in a bubble within the, one of the most you know, superficial industries on the planet. He's living mm. in, in LA in the in, heart of the entertainment. He's married to an actor. And, you know, he doesn't... The problem with authenticity is you've got to know who you are mm. to be authentic. And this poor kid doesn't... Kid, he's, what, nearly 40? Yeah. It's my elder state's piece. Yeah. I'm 50 now. Did you guys know that? <laughs> so, he doesn't know who he is. Yeah. yeah. And how do, you, how do you communicate genuine, uh, you know, an authenticity to your brand and to the things that you do when you fundamentally don't know it yourself. That is a brilliant point. Can I just Thank say that it really much. goes you to the heart back. of sorry, sorry, Carol. Yeah, I right. simply must say that is exactly what my takeaway from the book was. Yeah. Is simply, you do feel sorry for him. Yep. Separating it from the circus yeah. with Megan, it, you do feel so sorry for him because he's a boy who just never really grew up around people that he felt he could be himself around. Trust. He was mm. so damaged by his mother's death, and you feel sad for him because doesn't know who he is. hundred percent. But then I go, will. William turned out all right, and he's not the first person in the world to have childhood trauma. Yeah, I mean, I'm just... I mean, I, that's yeah. a tangent for another day. Sorry, Caroline. But, but no, 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 no. That's trying to... Because we're going to move on to uh, now William and Kate. Um, and it's still on the branding yeah. part of it. At the Scottish coronation, King Charles really made sure that William and Kate were the centre of yeah. that coronation. We talk about the slimming down of the monarchy. We talk about the modernising of the monarchy. Is that just another piece to that puzzle? Yes, it is planned, I suppose, but it still looks I, I think, in place. To me, I think it is that, that part of what we're seeing is actually incredibly authentic because there was the thing, what, like uh, one example of which, uh, the homelessness project that Prince William mm. launched in the last couple of weeks, and um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe he's giving away some royal lands mm. as part of that project. This is, in my view, a, a new generation of royals who are reading the room, who understand that, in, that their longevity is a reliant upon you know, m f crude phrase, but moving with the times mm -hmm. and under and and going out there and working and and working as royals work, which you you know what it's like, how exhausting it is to be around pe as a journalist to be around people twenty four seven. People go, oh, that's not really work. You want to try what they do? Yeah. I wouldn't do it for all the money in mm. the world. And this is brand royal, and the royal, whether you like it or not, the royal. Business, the royal family, is incredibly important to the mm. British economy, to the UK economy. I think this is an authentic move by Charles and I think it's a strategic move and I think it's really, I think it's really great to see. And, and Bronte, you know, we had the big coronation in London and mm -hmm. that there was a full-on affair. Um, but I think the royals, again, have read the room in relation to the Scottish coronation because it was a much more docile event. It was, and it's also a very important one because Scotland is traditionally a little bit less um, keen on the monarchy yeah. than the other parts mm. of Great Britain. So this one was basically, we, we're calling it colloquially a mini coronation. It actually was not officially a yeah. coronation. That's already happened, of course. So this one was a service of Thanksgiving, but it did run in a way that was a very a smaller version of what we saw in May. So there was still pomp and ceremony, but it was to that... Um, a bit more of a localised effect. So we had the procession. There was only about a thousand people in that. I say only. <laughs> yeah. It's still a crowd, it's isn't it? Yeah. Wedding. Yeah, just yeah. A, yeah, exactly. Yeah, just, a, just a big wedding. So uh, there was a royal procession where uh, Kate and William travelled, as we talked about, um, with Charles and Camilla. They had the service of Thanksgiving where Charles and Camilla received the honours of Scotland, which includes the crown, the scepter and a sword. Mm. Fun fact, they used a new sword that had ah. never been used. It was named after Elizabeth. Do you Elizabeth name a sword? sword. Apparently you do. Um, and because the other one was too old. But they have a new one that's been named after Aww. the late Queen. So they had... They then had the procession back to Holyrood House Palace. 
and they had the 21 gun salute so it's all it's the kind of thing as i said we saw yeah. the the real coronation and then they had the uh, red arrow fly pass which yeah. we got a much Always smaller loved. version of yeah so it was yeah. actually it was the proper one on the day because yeah. you know because of the weather mm. on may 6 we didn't get the full show so that was uh yeah it was very special imagine having a sword with your mum's name on it though yeah well, that it's is a little weird. awkward it is it's a bit weird. unusual anyway but, Jem, just one thing before we go. I've only got about a minute. Um, <laughs> Harry. Yes? Harry is reportedly doing a solo project for Netflix. Yes. Um, I really feel like this here is him doing his own thing, bit of his own credibility, bit of his own passion this project. This is the Africa thing, right? Yeah. I actually is that love, how you see it? I do, and I love this because if you remember, like, Happy Harry before mm. his world went the direction it's gone... He, he was so genuinely connected to Africa and I think he mentioned this in the documentary as well, that he felt safe there, he grew up there, They there was a healing place for him mm. and, of course, his relationship with Chelsea Davey played mm. out in Africa. He all, That was the place that he went to, to, to feel, feel fulfilled. I think this is brilliant. I think if anything can set him, don't know about them, but him on a course to writing himself and pra perhaps yeah. the authenticity Connecting that we talked about. Is, yeah. This is the vehicle. It's not some confected, contrived thing on Spotify where he interviews Vladimir Putin about his childhood. Well, that would be very unusual. Anyway, ladies, thank you so much. <laughs> That's a note to end on. Bronte Coy and Gemma Tognini, thank you so much for joining us.